بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. The last time we were here, we spoke about the virtues of Ramadan, and the point behind that was to try and excite us so that we can come into the month with vigor and energy to worship Allah Azza wa Jal to the best of our ability. Today, we're going to try to look at Ramadan once again, but look at it through the lens of learning the lessons of brotherhood. So we want to understand the importance of brotherhood in general, and also how Ramadan, as an act of worship, can help us develop and practice brotherhood by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have in the hadith of Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Asawm yawma tasumun, wal fitr yawma tuftarun, wal adha yawma tudahun. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the fasting is the day when you all fast. And the breaking of the fast, meaning the Eid, is the day when you all break the fast. And the Adha, the Eid al-Adha, is the day when you all celebrate Eid al-Adha. So how does this hadith point towards lessons in brotherhood? This small hadith that I've just taken. Ahsant, very good, this is the point, Jazakallah khairan, that it's a communal obligation. The Prophet ﷺ was speaking in plural, meaning to the community, that when you fast, you fast all together. And when you break your fast, you break your fast all together. So it's reminding us that we're doing this act of worship as a community, as an ummah. And you'll find that not only did the scholars, they speak about the importance of this, the majority of the ulama, they said that in fact one person citing in the ummah suffices the rest of the ummah. That's the majority opinion. Okay, there is another opinion which is that it's Imam Shafi, I believe, that only those which share the same zones of the, uh, the moon sighting, etc., they are the ones that will uh, fast together. But the majority, they said, if it's one sighting anywhere in the world, then it becomes obligatory upon the whole of the Ummah. And this shows you and makes you want to reflect and think about the importance of brotherhood. That Allah and the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they want us to understand that we are one people, one nation, regardless of our backgrounds, our culture, where we are in the earth. We're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one Lord. We're upon one path, which is Islam, and we have one final Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much to unite us, but yet sadly, we are so disunited. You find that how can we implement this hadith? Because so many countries, they don't even talk to each other, Muslim countries. So many tribes, they look down upon each other. So many peoples, they despise each other because you don't share the same color, you don't share the same tongue, you don't share the same culture. All of this is rejected in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us and the Quran is teaching us time and time again that we are a brotherhood and a sisterhood. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we belong to one ummah, therefore we should try to behave in that manner. <clears throat> so we said that we should fast all together as a community. A fiqh question to keep us intellectually engaged. If you were to travel from one community, right, where you started your fast, and then you went to another community who had started the fasting a day after. So you have ended up praying fasting 30 days. Some of the brothers from the fiqh class, they can't answer because they know the question. So you have fasted 30 days, but you've gone to another country where they only fasted 29 days because they started after you, right? So what is your situation? They still have a day to fast wherever you landed. So if you fast with them, you're going to end up fasting 31 days. And we know that Ramadan, the maximum is 30 days. What are you supposed to do? Here again, the majority of the ulama, they said you should fast with the community that you end up in, meaning 31 days. So even if it's over 30 days, you stick with the community and you break your fast with them. This is the majority opinion. Another opinion is that you break your fast, but you don't show that you have broken your fast. You eat secretly. What about the opposite situation? So there, it's already eat there. You still have a fast to make up. You still have a fast to make up. What do you do in that situation? You have to fast after the Eid. Why can't you do it on Eid? Because Eid is a day that you cannot fast, right? Eid is a day which is haram for you to fast. So though you have to make up, you have a fast left. Once you get there, you have to celebrate the Eid with them in unity. And you have to make up the day that you had left later on. Jazakumullah khair. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he encourages us to be a community, to be together. Allah says, 
Innama is adatul hasr, meaning that when you find this word in the Quran, in the ahadith, innama, it means that that which comes after it is the only understanding of the term or of the noun or the description. Innama al mu'minun, certainly the believers are only this. What are they only? Ikhwa, they are brothers, they are a brotherhood. So it's as though Allah is saying, there is no other description for the believers except that they are a brotherhood and a sisterhood. Unite between your brothers and sisters, Allah says, and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability, perhaps, or in the hope that you will have mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and guides us that when we seek protection, when we seek counsel, we should seek it from each other and not those outside of the Muslim community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu, la tattakhidu bitanatan min dunikum, la ya'lunakum khabala, waddu ma'anitum, qad badatil baghda'u min afwahihim, wa ma tukhfi suduruhum akbar, qad bayyanna lakum al-ayati in kuntum ta'qilun. O oh, you who believe, do not take as close advisors and protectors for, you, for yourselves other than yourselves, meaning outside of the community, outside of the believing community, because they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, only wish bad for you. And they will need, leave no effort in causing you harm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we should only take advice and counsel from ourselves. But do you see that situation possible today? Like I said, everyone has turned their backs on each other. How can we take advice and counsel from each other if we don't trust each other? If we don't love each other? If you don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way we were supposed to worship together? So in order for us to be able to take the counsel from each other, we need to have trust. We need to have bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave us in the hadith a true likeness of how the believer is. He said, مَثُلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادِهِمْ وَتَرَاحُمِهِمْ وَتَعَاطُفِهِمْ كَمَثْلِ جَسَدْ إِذَا اشْتَكَ مِنْهُ عُدْوًا تَدَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَائِرُ الْجَسَدْ بِالسَّهْرِ وَالْحُمَّةِ the Prophet ﷺ said that the likeness of the believers, the similitude, is the likeness of a body. That if one part of the body feels a pain, then the rest of the body will react in having a fever or a sleepless night. That's how the believers are supposed to be, tight, close. If there's a pain or a difficulty somewhere, then the believers, they will feel that pain and difficulty of the ummah. They will go to them, help them, aid them. And if they cannot do anything physically, they will not leave dua for those people. It's not a case that we don't care, they're far away, we only take care of ourselves. No, the believers have to be united as one ummah to the best of their ability. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he further emphasizes this in the Quran, where he said, Muhammad al-Rasulullah, وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those believers who are with him, they are harsh to those disbelievers who try to cause them pain, who tries to cause them harm. Yet they are full of mercy to one another. They are full of mercy to one another. We have in Ramadan, Salat al-Taraweeh. Taraweeh, as we know, is a communal act of worship. And it's something which is recommended for us to do. Highly recommended. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Man sama Ramadan, iman wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhanbihi. Whoever comes and man qama Ramadan, iman wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhanbihi. Whoever stands the nights of Ramadan out of faith and expectancy of reward from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, then he will have his previous sins forgiven. And this is referring, of course, to Qiyam al-Layl, to Taraweeh. But when we go to Taraweeh, don't just look at it as being a sunnah act of worship in Ramadan. Go to Taraweeh this time around in Ramadan, and when you are there in the masjid, look around you and see all the different colors, see all the different languages, see all the different cultures that are together with you, bowing and prostrating and in love with the same creator that you are in love with. This will bring you more joy to your heart. This will bring you a an immense appreciation of what Allah has given us from brotherhood and sisterhood in the Ummah. Because you will see hundreds if not thousands of people with you in the masjid enjoying the same act of worship that you are enjoying. So don't just go in the normal manner. Go and enjoy what the, the variety of colors and tongues and culture etc. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed to be in the Ummah worshipping Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's narrated by Abi Masood in radiyallahu anhu, who said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَمْسَهُ مَلَاكِبِنَا فِي الصَّلَاةِ وَيَقُولْ 
istawu wa la takhtalifu fa takhtalifa qulubukum that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to pass by the lines of the worshippers and he would ensure that they were standing close shoulder to shoulder foot to foot but of course when you do the shoulder to shoulder and foot to foot it shouldn't be exaggerated you shouldn't be harming the person next to you you know some people they end up doing the splits in the salah and they end up pushing their feet very toughly next to the next person no it should be done very calmly so the prophet sallallahu would check the lines to ensure that they were very straight and he would say la takhtalifu do not differ in the line meaning not one of you should be standing forward and one of you should be standing back and sadly many of us we have this careless attitude in the salah you find people step a, a bit forward or a bit back or too much space between the shoulders and feet this is not the sunnah so the prophet sallallahu was establishing that for them and he said if you differ in your salah in the standing then it will cause a differing in your hearts so this is what we have to bring to mind again also for the sake of brotherhood that when we establish the salah we are also establishing the unity of the hearts because the prophet sallallahu said if you do not straighten the rows then your hearts will not be together so think of this act of worship the taraweeh not as only in the way i mentioned but also when you establish the prayer next to your brother or sister you are establishing the hearts to be close together for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now when you go to taraweeh and the imam he prays more than you want to pray you hold a different opinion to the imam what should you do should you leave after you've prayed what you want to pray or should you stay with the imam why stay with the imam because you get the reward of praying the whole night as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man qama al ma'al imam hatta yansarif kutiba lahu qiyamul layl kulla whoever stays with the imam until he leaves then he will receive the whole night worth of praying so don't take the risk don't lose out on that huge reward of receiving the whole night of you praying in qiyam al-layl whatever the imam is praying then pray with him and this is the fatwa of sheikh Baz and other people what if you have a situation where you have two imams in the masjid in taraweeh right sometimes you get two imams in the masjid so one prays eight then the other one prays eight and a bit more what do you do in that situation because you wanted to pray eight so you can say okay i prayed with one imam from his start and his end he left so i left with him is that the correct understanding even here it's incorrect shaykh uthaymin ta'ala he said that the one is naib to the other one is like a representative of the other okay so they're still considered doing one act of worship so the one act of worship has to be completed for you to get the reward of the whole night so do not in that situation leave the masjid we have in Ramadan the act of worship which all of us will do is at the time of iftar but the Prophet وسلم, he encouraged us as narrated by Imam Ahmad and others uh, Imam Tirmidhi for example the Prophet وسلم, said Man sa'iman, ajrihi, la min ajri sa'imi shay. the Prophet وسلم, said whoever gives the iftar whoever breaks uh, feeds the fasting person so that he can break his fast then he will receive the same reward as the fasting person except that it will not diminish the reward of the fasting person in any way shape or form so you find here and it's something to think about that you as the strong brother as the rich brother as the brother who has status in society you're not the poor one you're not the one who cannot provide you're not the one who is looked down upon by people for not having much in society you are the one who's rich you are the one who has status you are the one who has capability so use that to take care of those who are weaker than you use that to take care of your brothers who cannot take care of themselves and the sisters who cannot take care of themselves lower your wing of mercy by providing iftar like mentioned in this hadith so not only will you get the reward of the fasting person but also you get the reward of the brotherhood and the sisterhood which we are trying to remind ourselves with so when we have this community of thoughts it's beautiful we come together we sit with each other we break our fast but let's not forget the thousands upon thousands of people throughout the world who are in need for us to help them break the iftar in the month of ramadan for us it's luxury for us it's fun for us it's enjoyable to get together for them it's a matter of life and death some of them they cannot survive the day because they don't have food to survive so if we keep that in our minds we spend a bit of money giving them the food that they require then the reward is huge by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ramadan pertaining to brotherhood teaches us 
that we have to have good character and good behavior amongst ourselves, especially between family members. The fasting teaches us that how in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu narrated by Abu Hurairah, he said, Man lam yada qawlu zur wa amal bihi, falaysa lillahi haja an yada ta'amuhu wa sharabuhu. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever doesn't leave alone vain speech, false speech, and false behavior, meaning acting in a bad way and speaking in a bad way, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has no need for him to leave alone his food and his drink. And in another hadith in Hakim, the Prophet Sallallahu also narrated by Abu Hurairah, he said, لَيْسَ الصِّيَامْ مِنَ الْأَكَلْ وَالشُرْبِ He said, fasting is not to abstain from eating and drinking. إِنَّمَا الصِّيَامْ مِنَ الْلَغْوِ وَرَفَثِ That verily siyam is from bad speech and bad behavior. فَإِنْ سَابَكَ أَحَدْ أَوْ جَهَلَ عَلَيْكَ فَقُلْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ So if somebody comes to you and acts to you, acts with you in an ignorant way or tries to swear at you, then say loudly, I am fasting, I am fasting. So you see how the fasting is training us? The Prophet ﷺ is telling us in the first hadith that if you do not leave alone bad speech, then Allah has no need of you to leave alone your drink and your food. And in the second hadith, it's not only teaching us that we have to abstain from bad behavior, which is the real reality of fast, to bring about taqwa, to bring about an increase in iman and good character, etc. The Prophet ﷺ said, if somebody comes to you and insults you and tries to abuse you, then you have to remind them and remind yourself that you are fasting. So why do we say it loudly in Nisa'im? To remind yourself that I'm fasting, I have to behave in a particular manner. And also to remind the person who's being abused is that perhaps these words may cause him to calm down and to feel ashamed of behaving in the way that he's shame, that he's behaving. So that's why you say in Nisa'imun, in Nisa'imun. I'm fasting, I'm fasting. One of the most important traits for us to have in terms of brotherhood and sisterhood is that of atasamuh. Atasamuh is that of overlooking each other's faults. Because we're going to be fasting, right? You know what happens when there's no food. The days can get long, the tempers can flare over the smallest of issues. We're going to make mistakes, so we have to overlook the mistakes of one another, where we are able to overlook. Because sometimes people, they take these kind of words that we should overlook mistakes, which is the foundation of our behavior. We should overlook each other's mistakes, but not in every single situation. Sometimes there's times when mistakes are not overlooked and you have to hold the people to account. But in general, we overlook the mistakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةَ وَلَا سَيِّئَةَ The good deed and the bad deed are not equal. إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ Repel evil with that which is better. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلْيٌ حَمِيمٌ So it will be the situation that if you behave like that, you repel evil with that which is better in terms of character and speech, then the one that you find yourself having some kind of, some kind of enmity with, then Allah Azawajal will cause it to be that the person ends up being a very close friend of yours. Why? Due to good character, due to good words, due to overlooking, due to not being upset with every single mistake that a person makes. Every time we look at another person and we get upset, let's not forget, we have the same equal amount of mistakes in our own closet, in our own bank of deeds. Let's try to always put things in perspective. Perhaps the person made a mistake because he's having a bad day. Perhaps he's got issues that he needs to deal with outside of work. So within our families and within our brotherhood, we try to overlook as much as we can and we try to behave in the best of character. In Ramadan, one of the main things that we find ourselves doing is that we implore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, continually, if we have any sense, to forgive us. We're always asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the month of Ramadan to forgive us because we know that the gates of heaven are open and we want to be from those who traverse through those gates in those blessed moments. So continually, if you have sense, you are making dua to Allah azawajal to forgive you. What is the recommended dua that you should make in Ramadan for forgiveness and on Laylatul Qadr? Ahsant Aisha radiyallahu anha, she narrates as in Tirmidhi. She said, Ya Rasulullah, arra'ayta in alimtu ayya laylatin, ayyu laylatin laylatul Qadr, ma aqul fiha. She said, Aisha radiyallahu anha, she said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, do you see if I come to realize which night 
is the night of the Laylatul al Qadr. What should I say in terms of dua? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Quli Allahumma innaka a'fuun tuhibbu al-a'fuwa fa'fu anni. Oh Allah, you are love to pardon and forgive, so forgive me my sins. This is a dua that should be continually said throughout Ramadan and especially on the nights when you are seeking Laylatul Qadr. But here's the thing. When you make dua for yourself, don't forget the dua for your brothers and sisters throughout the world. When you're making dua for your forgiveness, we all know somebody whose deen is not as strong as it should be. Even though our deen is not as strong as it should be, well, but we're good at pretending. Maybe the other person is not as good as us at pretending that his deen is good. So if we know of somebody, their deen is not that good and they have sins, make dua for them. Like you are begging and imploring Allah that you be forgiven and you be guided and you be corrected, also make dua for your brother and sister that you see in them faults. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Imagine if we had that attitude with our brothers and our sisters. Imagine the outlook the ummah would have towards one another. Imagine the love and empathy that would be there. If every time we saw faults, rather than straight away attacking them, we would bow down to Allah Azawajal, prostrate to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and make dua for that person. That is a sincere person. The person who can do that for his brothers and sisters is a sincere person because he wants change for them. It's not about winning points. Aha, I found you got a mistake and I proved to everybody else that actually I was better than you. This should never be the attitude of the believer. Like I said, there are times when we have to clarify and we have to sometimes expose, but that's a complete different topic. But the general understanding and the general behavior, the default behavior is one of seeking forgiveness for your brothers and sisters. Abdullah ibn Masudin radiallahu anhu, he said, if you see a man amongst you having committed a sin, do not supplicate Allah against him and do not revile him. Instead, pray to Allah to cure him and accept his repentance. For when we, the companions, used to see a man die upon something good, we would have hope for him. And when we used to see a man die upon wrongdoing, we would fear for him. Narrated by Ibn Abi Dunya in Kitab Tawbah. So you see that this was the attitude of the companions. That when they would see people falling into sin, they would make dua for this person. طيب, so if you better your character, and you make dua for your brothers and sisters, is there a special reward for you? In Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abi Dada radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُسْلِمٍ يَدْعُوا لِأَخِيهِ بِذَحْرِ الْغَيْبِ إِلَّا قَالَ الْمَلَكِ وَلَكَ بِمِثْلِ وَفِي الْرِوَايَةُ آمِينَ Abi Dada radiallahu anhu narrates in the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there is no believing slave who makes a dua for his brother or sister Except that an angel is appointed to him and says, Ameen, in one narration and in the other narration, for you also. This dua that you are making for your brothers and sisters, for you also. An amazing way to get forgiven, right? Imagine if you get into the habit of making dua that Allah forgives such and such. Make this person's iman better. Help this person in his job. Help this person in his difficulty. Imagine the, the ajr that you are getting. Not only are you getting the reward of making dua for that person, but imagine the good the goodness because the angels are saying ameen and you also may your iman increase may your job get better may your affairs become easier and this upon the tongue of an angel so all of this we are learning through ramadan ramadan teaches us about brotherhood etc which dua covers the forgiveness for all believers which dua is generally made for all believers أحسنت الله مغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء الأحياء منهم والأموات. Okay, this you regularly hear. This hadith is narrated by Imam Tabarani. Okay, it's reported by Ubada that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "من استغفر من استغفر whoever seeks forgiveness لمؤمن أو مؤمنة كتب الله له لكل مؤمن ومؤمنة حسنة." That whoever seeks forgiveness for a for any believing uh, for the believing men and the believing women then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes for that person that they get a good deed for each believing man and each believing woman so you make the dua for a billion people in the ummah you get the reward of a billion hasanat authenticated this hadith by Sheikh al-albani rahimullah ta'ala but the majority of the hadith scholars of the past and present they said this hadith is weak they said this hadith is weak Okay? Allah maghfir lil muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. All a hadith similar to that which mention 
a particular reward, like the one I just mentioned, there was a particular reward. They say that all the ahadith which are mentioning a particular reward, then this hadith, these ahadith are weak. But Shaykh Al-Bani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and a few of the hadith scholars, they said it's authentic. Why am I bringing this up? Because you hear it often. And it's related to our topic. But if you hold the hadith, if you hold the dua to be authentic, then obviously your situation is easy. You go ahead and make the dua. But if you hold that the dua is not authentic, does it mean that you can never make that dua? It's an important point I'm trying to get to. So you may be from those who hold or follow the scholars that say that this dua and those like it are not authentic. And I said the reason for it not being authentic, one of the reasons uh, is the fact that it mentions a specific reward. And the ulama, they said that the, all of those ahadith that mention the specific reward for the one who does seeking this forgiveness, then these ahadith are weak, right? And of course, in the chains of narration, there's weakness that they show. So the question is that if you are of those that hold the opinion that the hadith is weak, it's not reported from the Prophet Sallallahu does it then mean that you cannot use it in dua? Like you want to seek forgiveness for the believing men and women. The scholars, they say, you can use the weak hadith in dua as long as it's not in a place where the Prophet Sallallahu taught you a specific dua. You get it? You can use a weak hadith as long as it's not in a place where the Prophet ﷺ taught you to use a specific du'a or a range of specific du'as. Give me an example. Where would the Prophet ﷺ would have taught us huh, to use a specific du'a? Any example. What about the beginning of the salah? The du'a al-istiftah. The Prophet ﷺ told us a variety of du'as, right? So now you are not allowed to go and bring a du'a which is not authentic to replace those authentic du'as which you know the Prophet ﷺ told you to use. However, in other parts of the salah we are, where you are allowed to make dua al-mutlaq like at the end of the salah the Prophet Sallallahu said seek any dua that you wish after making the tashahud here you can make this dua and even outside of the salah you can make this dua in a general place so this is the rule if you come across a hadith which is weak or you come across a dua which you really like its meanings are good but you cannot find that it's authentic or you cannot find the narration for it you're allowed to use that dua in the situation that I explained to you okay in general situations I hope that's beneficial, inshallah. Tayyib. And we also have the dua in the Quran, which is for seeking forgiveness for your brothers and sisters, which is, Rabbana gfilli walid walidayya walil mu'minina yawma yaqum lisab. Oh Allah, forgive me and my parents and all of the believers on the day when you will take people to account. So in this dua, you are making it anyway, uh, seeking forgiveness of all the believing men and women. And there are many others in the Quran. In Ramadan, there is a gathering where the believers come together in close proximity, but they're not supposed to speak to each other. What is that gathering? I'tikaf. I'tikaf, because the purpose of I'tikaf is to seclude yourself from the world and dedicate yourself to worship Allah. But many people, they flip it. They bring society into the masjid. They do a bit of worship, alhamdulillah, but most of the time, they're talking and enjoying each other's company. No. In i'tikaf, stay away from the people. Seclude yourself as much as you can. Worship Allah Azawajal. Use those moments to walk through the gates of Jannah. However, you can still establish brotherhood at that time. How? Through serving your brothers. Especially the elderly brothers that are with you in the masjid. When it comes to time for suhoor and iftar, make sure you are the one that is serving the food. Make sure you are the one that is cleaning up. Make sure you are the one that is asking the elderly uncles, is there anything I can do for you? That is how you get more reward of brotherhood through that act of worship. The Prophet ﷺ, to finish and conclude, he mentioned the narration in the mustadrak of Imam al-Hakim. We heard this term often, mustadrak, comes from the word istidrak. Mustadrak of Imam al-Hakim, who is a famous hadith scholar, is a collection of a hadith where he felt that Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim overlooked certain ahadith which he felt actually fell into the categories of being authentic by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. So he collected a group of ahadith that he felt were under the same categorization that Imam Bukhari had and Imam Muslim had. Okay, this is why it's called mustadrak. Mustadrak means to, to kind of find the fault. Okay, so it's the mustadrak of Imam Hakim. He narrates the hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wajabat muhabbati. My love becomes obligatory. Or my love is assured. What do you want to do after hearing this hadith? If I stop here. 
You want to smile, you want to get happy, you want to ensure that you memorize what's coming next, right? Wajibat muhabbati lil mutahabina fiya. For those who love each other for my sake. Wa mutajalisina fiya. For those who sit with each other for Allah's sake. Wa mutazawirina fiya. For those who visit each other for Allah's sake. Wa mutabadilina fiya. For those who spend on each other for Allah's sake. So we ask Allah that we be from those who we strengthen the ties of brotherhood and sisterhood in the month of Ramadan and outside of the month of Ramadan. We ask Allah that we are from those who hear these beautiful teachings and are able to act upon them. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All mistakes and shortcomings were for myself and shaitan. Anything which is correct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free.